Hey everybody, Senator Tim Kaine here. It's a treat to be with you, even if virtually at the McCain Forum to talk about a very important topic, America's soft power and the role we play in the world with that power going forward. I'm honored to do this uh, for John and his friends, having been a member of the Armed Services Committee uh, when John was chair and also having served on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee together. Uh, what an honor to be with you. And next year we'll do it in person and you can hold me to that. Uh, wh what a great topic. I'm gonna start with a story about the phrase soft power. I'm also on the Health Education Labor Pension uh, Committee. And as we do education work again and again, what I hear from employers is uh, they want soft skills. And uh, of course they want training and, and they want credentials, but when they talk about soft skills, what they mean is teamwork, flexibility, uh, innovation, ability to cooperate, stay till the job is done. Um, things that aren't necessarily conveyed in a university course or even in a um, career or technical curriculum. And at some point I was hearing that phrase soft skills and I said, you know, soft isn't the right word for it. You're talking about survival skills. You're talking about success skills. So I'd like to first posit that the notion of soft power, the, the phrase does not do justice to the concept. And the concept that we're really looking for is success and survival so that America and our allies can thrive in a very complicated world. The first soft skill, but we'll just call it a survival skill that we need is to beef up the strategic advantage that America still has over any other nation in the world, which is our network of alliances. That is what we have that our adversaries don't have. And frankly, um, it won't surprise anybody that I wasn't a big fan of the past administration. I could say things I, they did well that I liked, and I could give a lot of criticisms. But in the sort of national security foreign policy space, in my view, the most significant challenge of the previous administration was a retreat from what I viewed as the recognition and heightening of alliances. When you put uh, trade sanctions on allies like Europe or Canada, when you pull out of multinational organizations, when you scotch um, diplomatic deals, whether it was the Paris Climate Accord or the Iran nuclear deal, uh, in all of those areas, what you're doing is you're fraying the unique power that the United States has in terms of our allies. We're strong in so many ways. Our military is strong. Our economy is strong. Our moral example is strong as long as we strive to keep it so. But uh, if you analyze the behavior of our adversaries, the thing that frightens them the most is not any single military platform we have or technology we pioneered. They go to school on us and they try to catch up with us. And in some areas, they get close. But what really scares them is the network of alliances that we slowly and patiently built up and global institutions that we slowly and patiently built up for virtually the last 75 years. Um, that's what excites me about the moment in time right now and about the current administration. I think Joe Biden, a Senate Foreign Relations Committee member for three decades, a vice president and now president, understands that America's alliances are so very key. Um, and so one of the topics that I think is really important as we look at this dimension of what I would call the survival skills of soft power is better and better ties between global democracies. In August of 2017, I wrote a piece in, um, in uh, foreign policy called A New Truman Doctrine, where I analyzed 70 years since um, uh, George Kennett had written his famous piece, The Sources of Soviet Conduct, in foreign policy, kind of analyzed and set out what became the Truman Doctrine, an organizing principle used by presidents and congresses of both parties. And I asked whether such a, a doctrine that could be bipartisan and long lasting was even possible in American politics today. Um, my assertion in 2017 pretty much stands in 2021. You have to analyze that the world is a very different place. The Truman Doctrine came up in a time of essentially a bipolar competition between an American-led Western Bloc and a Soviet Union-led Eastern Bloc with some nations identifying as not aligned. That's not the world we live in today. The arrangement of power is very different and I view it as a sort of a tripolar competition between three forms of government and three philosophies about government and representation of a citizenry. The world is composed of democracies, 
and authoritarians and non-states. Within the democracies, there are great variations of nascent and mature, small and large, uh, new and long-standing. The good news is there are democracies all over the globe. Uh, within the authoritarians, there's vast differences between a Turkey and a China and a North Korea and a Russia and Iran. And yet they have authoritarian tendencies and increasingly they're asserting not only their right to do things, let us do what we want to do, but particularly China is asserting that the authoritarian model is actually the preferred model for everyone else. And then we have non-state organizations, terrorist organizations, narco traffickers, even international businesses that don't necessarily feel an alliance to any particular country. And we have to take into account their dramatic rise of this non-state power. What should the United States do to be as important a part of the 21st century as we were in the 20th century in terms of global leadership? I think the most important thing we can do is first, be strong ourselves. Um, there's a notion Madeleine Albright announced that said that America is the indispensable nation. And even though I love Madeline, and there's a lot of truth to the words, I never liked that phrase because indispensable to me carries a sense of hubris about it. I would say the better thing for us to do is to try to be an exemplary nation and just live up to the things we say about ourselves. We're a society where all are equal and all have a chance. We, we will let you try to start a business. And if you fail, you get another chance. We welcome people of all religious backgrounds or none. We have a robust First Amendment expression of speech um, and, and the press, sometimes too robust if you're a public servant, but nevertheless, it's a strength of ours. Let's strive first and foremost in our uh, facing the world to just be as exemplary as we can and live up to our own uh, professed statements about ourselves. And frankly, if you're exemplary, you're more likely to be indispensable than if you try to be indispensable. But the second thing we should do, I think we should even spend more time on our democratic allies than we do on our adversaries. We often make a mistake of focusing on our adversaries and their challenges and assume that the democracies will be fine. But instead what we see in the globe's democracies are significant challenges, um, the fraying of the Eurozone, Brexit, you know, uh, a, uh, a challenge with uh, xenophobic anti-immigrant governments coming to power, even with authoritarian tendencies in some parts, anti-Semitism, devolution movements, whether it's Catalan separatism or potentially a Scottish independence referendum. The attack on the Capitol on January 6th shows that the United States is certainly not immune from some of the weaknesses bedeviling democratic societies. And so I think the second thing we need to do, in addition to trying to live up to our own example, is spend time trying to shore up the world's democracies. I posited in my piece in, um, in foreign policy, the need for a new organization of the globe's democracies, not a military organization primarily like NATO and not an organization like the OECD that's primarily for sort of Northern hemisphere, European and North American countries, but a gathering of the globe's democracies that celebrates that they exist all over the world that uh, raises up best practices that we can all so that we can all learn from, but that also has the confidence to look in a mirror and see where we can try to shore those up. I think the role of the United States is going to be as pivotal in the 21st century as the 20th, and the best thing we can do is work together to help our democracies share best pack best practices and overcome our weaknesses. And if we if we do that, we will prove a very very formidable. Um, an exemplary um, antidote to authoritarians and non-state actors that want to destabilize the United States and other nations. Um, so I can't wait to hear the panel discussion. You've got bright folks who are going to dig deeper into this topic, but thank you for asking me to be with you briefly today. Greetings and thank you everyone for joining us uh, for this McCain Institute Sedona Forum panel on America's global soft power future. Uh, my name is Steve Began, and it's my great pleasure to lead this discussion with three distinguished panelists. But before we start that discussion, I wanted to just uh, say a couple of thank yous first to Cindy McCain for her continued leadership of the McCain Institute and for the entire Institute leadership and staff for sustaining this Sedona uh, forum, even during this global pandemic. Obviously, we've had to make the, comp make the compromise of meeting virtually today, but all of us look very much forward 
to, uh, to uh, joining the McCain family out in Sedona next year. To start with, I'd like to uh, introduce our three distinguished panels who are, uh, panelists who are here to, to carry on this discussion today. Uh, I'd like to introduce them in order first, starting with Congresswoman uh, Liz Cheney. Liz was elected to the House of Representatives in 2016, and she's very quickly climbed the ranks of Republican leadership, now serving as the Republican uh, Conference Chair. Uh, Liz is a uh, widely respected and principled voice in national security and foreign policy circles among uh, the Republican, uh, uh, Republicans in Washington, and a recognized conservative leader. Um, Liz has uh, served in uh, public service for longer than her years in Congress. Um, she many years ago served in the Department of State as a senior official for the Middle East uh, and also has served a stint overseas with USAID. Uh, thank you, Congresswoman, for joining us today. Great. Our second, nice to see you, Steve. See you, Liz. Our second speaker is uh, Congress, Congressman Mike Waltz. And Mike is a born Floridian and uh, born and raised and now serves in the 6th Congressional District in Florida, uh, where he is himself quickly made his uh, stamp on, Amer on American foreign policy. We've seen a lot of Congress uh, Congressman Waltz over the past several days as President Biden has made his announcements regarding Afghanistan. And he's highly qualified uh, to be a commentator on those policies and decisions as uh, Mike served for more than two decades in the United States Army. He's a decorated Green Beret. He served in combat zones in the Middle East, in Africa, and Afghanistan. Prior to, join, uh, prior to joining the United States Congress, Mike also served as a advisor to former secretaries of defense, Robert Gates and Donald Rumsfeld. And he also served as a defense policy advisor to Vice President Richard Cheney. Uh, welcome, Mike. Glad to have you here yeah. today. Thanks. Great to be with you. Wish I was there with you in person. Our last speaker is a, a distinguished colleague from across the pond, uh, Baron Malik Brown. Uh, George, uh, Mark Malik Brown is well known to many of us for a lifelong pursuit of, of uh, development and refugee uh, relief. Uh, he has served in both public and private sector positions over a four decade career. Uh, Mark has uh, served as a, a senior official in both the United Nations, as well as uh, he has uh, served in the uh, cabinet of former Prime Minister Gordon Brown just a decade ago. He's got a background as a journalist, uh, a wide ranging career that uh, covers uh, uh, communications consulting. <clears throat> and he's currently uh, the president of the Open Society Foundations. Welcome, uh, Baron Malik Brown. Uh, thanks very much, Steve. So uh, I, I, as I said, I'm very grateful to the McCain Institute for continuing uh, the Sedona Forum, even during these trying times to discuss many important issues. And one of the most important is the contest between the United States and China that's playing out on a worldwide basis. And a strong dimension of that struggle is the soft power dimension of, of the US-China relationship. Here in the United States, we understand soft power uh, to be the way that our culture, our sports, our innovation, our technology and innovation, and our democratic freedoms inspire and influence other countries around the world, hopefully making them more benign towards the United States of America but especially hopefully investing them in upholding the world, the, the global rules-based order that has protected us all for the past 75 years. Yet, we find ourselves today in a global contest with China, the outcome of which very well may shape events for the century ahead. Liz, if I could start with you, and my first question is, does soft power present our country, the United States of America, and its like-minded partner with any particular advantages over China at this time. Well, thanks very much, Steve, and, and it's uh, really a, a pleasure to be here uh, with everybody today, and, and thank you to the McCain family uh, for, for doing this and, and your commitment to these issues. Uh, I think certainly the United States uh, and uh, our allies around the world, other nations that are guided by uh, dedication to those principles of, of freedom and liberty, uh, certainly uh, those, those at the end of the day, those ideas, um, that that way of structuring society, that fundamental belief and commitment to, um, you know, individual rights, uh, uh, are a, a tremendous advantage for us. Um, I think what you're seeing today globally um, is an effort by uh, the Chinese Communist Party, in particular, um, to advocate for and to push. Um, and to impose 
uh, an authoritarian uh, set of uh, values and beliefs um, combined very much with the, the technology of their surveillance state, um, which is a, a completely different way to order the world and to order society and one that is very dangerous and, and one that, that very quickly eliminates uh, those freedoms that have been so crucial for us, uh, for economic prosperity, for our security, um, uh, you know, for, uh, for many years, really, as you mentioned, the, um, the, the global world order that the United States in particular, but also with our allies, we could not have done it without our allies, uh, has helped to uh, sustain and establish and lead since uh, the end of World War II. So I, I think there's no, no question uh, that in the, the global battle of ideas, uh, in that competition of soft power, those nations that believe fundamentally in human freedom have uh, a tremendous advantage. Thank you. Uh, Congressman uh, Waltz, the uh, last few years have seen uh, uh, what many consider to be a reversal, actually, in the, uh, in the ideals and the, in the systemic uh, organization that, that Liz was laying out that, uh, that we believe, in, and I think many people around the world believe, is so attractive. Are we winning this, uh, this war? Of, uh, of soft power with China? Uh, the, so the short and direct answer is no. Uh, and, and in fact, I, I don't think we are uh, at this point. Uh, and it's not just uh, East Pacific or, or East Asia, excuse me, West, uh, Western Pacific base. It's, it's around the world. It's uh, Africa, South America, Central America. Uh, the Chinese through their, particularly through their economic soft power initiatives, uh, now control both sides of the Panama Canal. Uh, 25 out of 33 countries in South Central America now have major uh, Chinese infrastructure projects. Uh, we're now seeing, for example, uh, that the Chinese are buying up fishing rights in the Bahamas, uh, just a few miles off the coast uh, of Florida, and coincidentally adjacent to one of our major undersea kind of the Navy's top gun for submarine warfare under undersea testing site. Uh, so whether it's Honduras, Jamaica, uh, Venezuela, of course, uh, a, a space tracking station, I think is another great example of what we're seeing in Argentina, where uh, through Belt and Road and debt diplomacy, uh, they, they loan the Argentine government uh, uh, monies that they couldn't possibly afford and then took a mountain range for collateral. Uh, and then put a space tracking station on it that uh, can now track uh, our, our polar launches out of Vandenberg Air Force Base. So we're seeing this around the world. Uh, we're seeing uh, the massive growth of a Chinese uh, uh, naval base just to, literally across the, the bay from ours in Djibouti, uh, East Africa, that can control shipping going in and out of the Suez Canal. Uh, but they're doing it uh, through uh, primarily through economic means. They're flooding the zone with money. Uh, and the thing that is so frankly frustrating is it's our money. It's American money. Uh, between the capital they're raising on Wall Street, between our trade deficit and direct investment uh, into China, it is literally uh, American money that is funding uh, the military buildup, that's funding uh, Belt and Road. Uh, and so one of the things that I'm uh, wrestling uh, with, with Wall Street and many of our multinational corporations are is on this decoupling issue. Uh, and, on, you know, uh, and I've told many of them, uh, if we want to invest in a billion person market, uh, if we want to do so um, uh, in a way that's responsible to U.S. security, let's look at India. Uh, let's look at uh, Malaysia. Let's look at other countries uh, around there that aren't talking about actively uh, talking about replacing the American dream with the China dream. Uh, uh, that is not one, uh, a world that I want my children and grandchildren growing up in, but that is, uh, that's the road that we're on right now. And I think we need a real wake up call uh, in, in, a, in a Cold War style mentality uh, across the United States. We're starting to see that in polling. Uh, particularly when it comes to bringing our manufacturing back home and the dependencies that the Chinese government have actively created as a, as a key part of their national uh, security strategy. But I still think we have a, a lot of work to do in terms of the broader American uh, and Western psyche on what is going on, what's at stake, and what we need to do. 
So uh, Baron Malik Brown, uh, the congressman, describes that a mix of soft power and hard power that China is deploying that really has them on the march uh, globally. As, as you look at this, uh, uh, particularly from the perspective of someone who's not an American, uh, do you see China having advantages here? Uh, and, uh, and specifically, you know, here in the United States, we're a fractious democracy, never more fractious than we've been in the past several years. Uh, does this give, does this present China an opportunity or is this ultimately uh, going to be a vindication of the democratic system of government? Well, look, I, my starting point is where the rest of the panel is. I mean, China is a threat and it's got to be addressed. I, I, I think I, you know, the, where I start to depart a bit is the, the reference to a kind of Cold War mentality needs to be built because, you know, I do think our relationship with China is a lot more complex and multidimensional than it was with the Soviet Union. I mean, the Soviet Union was a military threat, but it really, the economic trade links were, were very, li very limited because they didn't make anything we wanted to buy and they couldn't afford to buy anything we made. So, you know, it was a very simple two-dimensional containment of the Soviet Union. You know, here, the trade and investment relationships, I think a little bit more uh, two-way than the Congressman acknowledges in that, you know, a, a lot of American debt is owned by China. It, it is, uh, it, it's, it's, there's a lot of two-way flows on trade, on everything else. So, and, and I think perhaps the more serious point is that while I'm completely where Congresswoman Cheney began of saying that, you know, this, that, that our democratic values should prevail. And when you look at China's soft power tools like the Confucius Institutes on American campuses, you know, they're a pretty sorry challenge to the extraordinary cultural and democratic and human rights leadership of the United States uh, and its allies. But the difficulty is through Belt and Road and through exactly what you said, Steve, the sort of fractious nature of democracy in all our countries in recent years, you know, they're starting to chip away at our core proposition that democracy always delivers for people in a better way than the Chinese system does. And now there are many citizens in regions of Africa and Asia and Latin America who, who no longer accept that automatic default position that democracy is going to be better. And so the Chinese with their model of the sort of efficient state using big data to look after your public health issues, to fight off COVID more efficiently than we've been able to, you know, are starting to offer an alternative authoritarian value-based model. And I think, you know, I, I'm absolutely with all of you, we've got to take that on, but we've got to take it on in a context of a more complicated, mutually interdependent economic, and for that matter, climate-based relationship where we both have to be allies in fighting climate change than perhaps the Cold War analogy allows for. Well, thank you very much. Uh, a lot to chew on there. Let me turn uh, from uh, from the challenge we face with China to a, a, a little bit more of an examination of America's own uh, soft power. So we've had a, a, a leaders over the years who have kind of put their stamp on the slogan, if you will, for the United States of America, uh, going back all the way to President Reagan, whose message to the world was America is a shining city on the hill. And he did this during the twilight uh, years of the Cold War. President George Herbert Walker Bush, uh, after the uh, Saddam Hussein's invasion of Kuwait, uh, made the firm uh, commitment that this will not stand, that the United States will act to uphold the global order. Bill Clinton followed uh, President Bush as president uh, and, and really could be summed up as having seen the United States as the indispensable nation in the post-Cold War world, that the, uh, the democracy never seemed uh, to be more of a global consensus than in those years. He was followed by George W. Bush, who was forced to contend with the attack on 9-11 and was determined to make the United States what he called a force for freedom, fighting back against the depredations of terrorists and extremists around the world. President Obama uh, was famously labeled with the slogan leading from behind but I think what they meant by that in, in all fairness was deference to and partnership with other, with other countries acting in concert in the, in the world. And finally, we most recently had President Trump's self-defining mantra 
of America first. It's pretty clear that uh, the emerging slogan of the new president, President Biden and his administration is America is back. What is America is back mean to you, Congressman Waltz? And, and, and what do you think our allies and partners and friends around the world want that to mean? Yeah, no, thanks. Uh, you know, gr great question. And, and just to add on to uh, some of the, some of the my favorite Reagan quotes, uh, what it was again, with it was in line with what Liz was saying, uh, in, in terms of really leading with our values. And we're seeing that uh, around the world as we deal with countries in Africa, as we deal with countries in South America and Asia, uh, that are starting to push back against uh, China's debt diplomacy, their heavy handedness, uh, the environmental destruction that often comes with their projects, uh, the lack of any type of labor protections. In fact, the lack of any type of local labor hires. Uh, they often ship in uh, literally battalions of Chinese workers uh, to, to take on those projects around the world. But one of the quotes that I love from Reagan uh, was that you can, you can go to France uh, but you never are truly French. You can immigrate to China, but you're never truly Chinese. You immigrate to the United States and you can truly become uh, American. And I think that really captures uh, the fact that we are still that shining uh, uh, city on a hill, but we have, to, uh, we, we have to maintain it and we have to sustain it. And frankly, we have to defend it. Um, and you know, to, to, to Howard's point, don't take it uh, from me uh, that we're, we're in a, a Cold War mentality, read or need to be in one, read Chinese literature, read not the, not the watered down uh, translations the CCP puts out around the world, but the actual translations uh, where he's telling his country to prepare for war, uh, that, he is, um, that he, they have engaged in a very aggressive campaign economically, diplomatically, uh, and, through, uh, and through modern information uh, uh, warfare to actively and aggressively subvert values in international organizations, uh, in uh, diplomatic organizations around the world. Uh, and again, you know, the, the slogan is the 21st century is the century of the China dream. But when he says that, he truly means the Han Chinese, uh, not obviously various uh, ethnic minorities uh, within China and certainly not uh, uh, from any type of regional uh, context. And then again, I'll just, I'll just end with uh, you know, another Reagan uh, quote, the, the, the shift that he made uh, as compared to his predecessors in dealing with the Soviet Union was that he actively, uh, he went ahead and, and, and talked about uh, the fact that the Soviets and, and communism was not something to be competed with, was not something to coexist with, uh, it was something that we had to prevail upon. Uh, and I think, again, uh, that was the shift that actually led to uh, the West victory uh, in the Cold War. And again, it, I think it's going to take that type of approach uh, as we move through the 21st century with the, with the threat that the CCP is. So, uh, Mark, what do you think uh, uh, the, the world wants from America under this new president? What, what in, the, in particular, in the soft power context, what is, what is the world looking for? Well, look, uh, it's consistency. <laughs> I think, and Steve, you, you've served at the very top of the State Department and you know the challenge that what allies above all want is predictability, which stretches across administrations. And, you know, they were used to, you know, a pretty sort of consistent, predictable model of American leadership that was bipartisan in nature. Of course, there were shifts of direction, but there was, you know, if you're a NATO ally, you broadly knew the direction America was going to take on issues. And, you know, the problem is, you know, we're up against a rival, China, which still embraces that principle of consistency through leadership that stays there forever. Um, but, you know, that's now the challenge for those of us abroad, you know, as you know, I mean, I, I, I think none of you would, would take exception to my saying that there's great relief, of course, at the arrival of Biden. I hope that it's a return to, you know, a more predictable foreign policy of the past. But really what you hear across Europe and in other regions as well is, but is it really going to stay? You know, what will happen in four years time? Uh, will we again have 
a competition at the polls between two very different visions of America and the world. And, you know, that makes it hard for President Biden to sort of mobilize allies for the long-term commitments he's seeking, whether it's the pro promotion of democratic values, whether it's a consistency in engaging around climate change or other more sort of normal, if you like, security and political agenda issues. And so you're seeing wariness on the part of allies. There's not the sort of honeymoon he might have anticipated. Instead, there's a questioning how long are you around for? How long will your word last for? And, and so I expect they'll overcome it, but at the moment, uh, as I say, there's a lot of scar tissue from the last four years in terms of foreign policy, and that has not yet healed. Thanks, Mark. And, and Liz, um, implicit in America's back is that America was gone. Wonder if you have any thoughts on that. And uh, in, in, in fairness to the Biden administration, we're not even 100 days into the to the president's term. But I wonder if you could comment a little bit on on what you see. Uh, is, is America back in the way that that you would want it to be? Well, uh, you know, I'm I'm concerned. I, I actually don't don't see things exactly the way that uh, that you and, and Mark have mentioned. You won't be surprised to hear. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, when you look, for example, at the announcement we saw just yesterday that, that uh, the United States, President Biden announced that we will be withdrawing all of our forces from Afghanistan by September 11th of this year. Um, when you're talking about what causes allies concern, I would point to things like that. I think that when um, our allies look to the United States, they do want consistency. They do want to know that our word means something. And frankly, you know, that has been a challenge. Uh, we saw it in the Obama administration with the precipitous withdrawal from Iraq. We saw it in the Trump administration with the uh, announcements of withdrawals and with um, the attitude and approach towards NATO. Um, but what we had in the Trump administration was a commitment to building up our, our, uh, our defense department to in providing the resources military needed. And, and I think there is no question that that hard power is a fundamental element behind our soft power. And so I, I do think, and I have heard from my allies over the course of the last 24 hours, um, concern, you know, wait, what does this mean? The United States has announced a date certain to withdraw from Afghanistan. And the president has gone so far as to say it's completely divorced from restrict from any conditions on the ground. It's based on a date certain. So I, I do think we are watching right now uh, the Russians test us. We're watching the Russian troop build up on the border with Ukraine. Uh, we're watching what's happening, uh, what the, the People's Liberation Army is doing with respect to Taiwan and other areas. There's a lot of testing going on. And I think ultimately, you know, if you look at what makes the United States of America most successful in being able to both defend the, the world order that defends freedom globally, uh, as well as providing assurance to our allies uh, and um, making sure that our adversaries also understand uh, our commitment to our values and to our interests and our security. Uh, it's, it's deterrence. It's knowing that we have both the will and the capacity and the capability to defend ourselves. Uh, I think the next thing that people will watch closely, we've already seen the Biden administration defense budget uh, top line come forward. It does not include, it, it's actually a, a reduction, uh, you know, not the three to 5% annual real growth we need. Uh, so I think there are some concerning signs. I think there are many of us, frankly, uh, I would hope in both parties, we had a number of our colleagues, Mike's and mine on the Democratic side of the aisle who were willing to be very supportive of um, the kind of robust foreign policy we need uh, when it was critical of President Trump to do that, I hope that those, al those uh, uh, colleagues will maintain that same commitment to those issues uh, in a Biden administration. I think that should be a nonpartisan issue um, that, that we all are recognizing the connection between America's ability to bring together the kind of alliances that really did help us to win the Cold War, recognizing that depends upon providing in many instances, an umbrella umbrella of strength, uh, and that that uh, deals directly with the capacity of our military forces. 
Thanks, Liz. Mike, uh, could I come back to you briefly on this before uh, before we move on to the next question? Uh, I've seen you almost nightly on the news this week uh, talking about this Afghanistan decision, and, and there are a few people who are more qualified in the United States Congress than yourself uh, to comment on this issue. Could you talk about it, but through the soft power dimension too, what, what, is, your, uh, what is your concern of the message it sends to adversaries and friends around the world uh, at, at, based upon your uh, your own experience with the uh, with the war in Afghanistan, well, I think it's sending the message uh, loud and clear that America is is unreliable. Uh, and and you know, to your point, I've been cons- and so has Liz been consistent on this through the last administration uh, and uh, and through this one. Uh, you know, I, I had real issue with the power sharing agreement uh, that that. President Biden's State Department was pushing on the Afghans. It called for the dissolving of the Afghan parliament, which, by the way, sets aside 25 percent of its seats in the Afghan constitution for women. Uh, What this means for ethnic minorities in the region that have been historically brutalized by the Taliban, Al Qaeda uh, and other extremist groups. And I think more broadly, you know, what does it mean in terms of our staying power when we're fighting a war of ideas and when we're fighting an extremist ideology? Uh, we all know the decades it took uh, to, uh, to defeat the ideology of communism, obviously fascism uh, before that. And what is our staying power when it comes to fighting the idea of, uh, of, uh, of Islamic extremism? And I can tell you there's this notion from a hard power standpoint that we can just go back. Um, you know, this is a very different situation than the pullout of Iraq. Uh, we have very, very few options in that region. In Iraq, obviously, we had you know, Israel, Turkey, the Gulf states, uh, and, and a number of other options. In Afghanistan, we really do not have any. Uh, it's surrounded by China, Russia, uh, Pakistan, and Iran. Uh, so uh, I, I have tremendous concerns. Uh, the intelligence community is clear. Uh, that uh, Al Qaeda and others will come roaring back. Uh, the Afghan government and security forces cannot sustain themselves without our support. But fighting our way back in this time uh, after sustaining threats to the homeland uh, is going to be far more difficult and far more costly than if we kept a persistent uh, uh, presence forward. And I just want to say on the allies issue very quickly, I think it depends on which allies you ask. Uh, of whether America's back or whether it was uh, there. Certainly, if you ask uh, our ally in Israel, uh, I I don't think they ever saw a greater uh, partnership than the last uh, administration. The Abraham Accords uh, were a tremendous step forward uh, for the Middle East. Uh, Ukraine, I think, had a very different uh, view than from uh, the Obama administration than the last and has real concerns they've expressed now uh, with this one. Uh, and then finally, you know, if I had a if I had a hundred bucks for every speech I wrote uh, for secretaries Rumsfeld, Gates and others when I was working for them, asking our NATO allies to live up to their commitments um, with the with the few exceptions, uh, the United Kingdom being one of them, I, you know, I'd be a wealthy man. So I think, uh, you know, obviously the strength that the United States has is in our alliances and the Quad Alliance. Uh, and that dialogue is one of the most significant in the 21st century. But everyone ha- also has to, to pull their fair share. Uh, and, and I do think going back to kind of situation as normal in terms of the United States taking on uh, the economic and the, and the military burdens um, isn't something that's sustainable as we have, uh, you know, 28 trillion in debt and climbing going forward. So there is going to have to be burden sharing in these alliances. Thanks, Mike. I really appreciate that answer. Um, if I could turn to an entirely uh, different subject, Mark, I, I'd like to <laughs> I'd like to start with you on this question. You know, Mark, uh, one of the things that is a constant thread throughout your career in public service at the senior ranks of the United Nations, of the World Bank, um, in, in Prime Minister Gordon Brown's government, in the Foreign Commonwealth Office, it's a a strong devotion to humanitarian causes, refugees, development, and so on. We find ourselves today still in the throes of this COVID-19 pandemic. Yet here in the United States, we're seeing the first glimmers of hope as our tremendous scientific, technological, and industrial achievements have permitted us 
to be able to design and produce and volume a vaccine that really has given the American people a, a first glimmer of hope that we may be soon able to emerge from this pandemic. But as we make the American people our first priority in treating, uh, in treating with this vaccine, there also have been some concerns raised about vaccine nationalism. And so let me ask you this, uh, soon enough, the production of these vaccines uh, here in the United States and globally will be sufficient to address the needs of the rest of the world. But China and Russia are already out there practicing what's known as vaccine diplomacy, using vaccines that in some cases, even their own people are reluctant to take, much less other countries. They're doing this in an attempt to win favor. And as I think you probably understand, while humanitarian assistance stands on its own as an imperative for governments around the world, it also does have a strong soft power component. Will the uh, global distribution of these vaccines present the United States and the West with a soft power opportunity? Or is it already too late for that with the Chinese and Russians moving out ahead? It's a, it's a really important question, Steve. Thank you. Um, look, I, I think there isn't anybody anywhere in the world who wouldn't prefer an American vaccine to, to a Russian or Chinese one. The sort of, if you like, the brand America of the scientific leadership this country has uh, is you know, without parallel. And the reason that the, therefore, the Russian and Chinese vaccines have made some headway um, is both because in some cases they've been given as a free good, but because of the fact that actually there just hasn't been that surplus of Western designed and manufactured vaccines in these first stages for the developing world. Uh, and COVAX, which was the scheme designed to provide vaccines for at least the first 20% of vulnerable groups across most developing countries, has been chronically underfunded and has had all sorts of difficulties in procuring and distributing vaccines at the anticipated level. And so I think there is a real opportunity here for this new administration, which wasn't available to the Trump administration because it was grappling with vaccine development. So this isn't at all a party political point. I'm not an American, but it is uh, the, the point that um, now with the science cracked, uh, Biden has the opportunity to you know, enter into arrangements with countries in the developing world, which will allow either the local manufacturer of those vaccines or at least the purchase and distribution of them. And the mRNA type vaccines clearly have much greater efficiency and protection than certainly the Chinese and probably uh, the Russian vaccine. So, you know, I, I think a push now could have huge leadership impact for the US beyond these shores. And by the way, a critical public health need for all of us because you cannot eliminate any kind of pandemic of this kind in one country only. We do need you know, that global containment and hopefully elimination uh, of COVID-19 if we're to move forward to the, our past lives of easy international travel without risk, et cetera. Thanks, Mark. You know. Um... It, it takes somebody who's watching from afar to make such a fair and balanced uh, judgment across these two administrations. It truly is a case of the best of both the worlds that, uh, that uh, part of the package in, in the Trump presidency was a brazenness to challenge conventions and, and to, to take on, uh, take on uh, challenges that seemed uh, undoable or insurmountable to other presidents. Um, and what the obvious strength of the Biden administration has brought in is an orderly uh, process of governing to allow the distribution of the vaccines that were developed in the Trump administration. I think this is probably a, a, a singular uh, bipartisan achievement that uh, across those two, admi uh, two administrations, but an area that few Americans will be able to find common ground on just because of the nature of our politics today. <laughs> Uh, but thank you for, for pointing that out. Uh, and, uh, and let me go to Liz and, and, and ask Liz, I know that the recent um, supplemental appropriations that uh, included $10 billion for foreign assistance to address, uh, in, among other things, the priorities around COVID-19. What more do we need to do as, as the United States of America in order to show the better side of America in fighting back against this pandemic globally? Well, I, I think uh, you know one thing. It's important to remember uh, is is where the virus came from, and I think that um, you know whether or not we are uh, 
you know, in a position where we we're able to say that the virus came from the lab in Wuhan, whether it came uh, from wet markets in Wuhan, um, the extent to which what we do know is that the, uh, the Chinese Communist Party knew that they had person uh, to person spread. They knew that that was going on. And you could watch the extent to which the, they, they stopped travel from Wuhan into the rest of, of China. Uh, but allowed travel from Wuhan into the rest of the world. And, and I think it's very important um, for us to understand and recognize and, and agree that that is what happened, that, that they knew there was transmission that was deadly, uh, and yet they still unleashed it. And I think um, we saw in the immediate aftermath of the, the beginning of the spread of the virus, um, and, you know, numbers of countries saying, wait a minute, we, we do need to take a look, for example, at supply chain issues. We need to recognize and understand that if, if the government of China is not going to conduct itself in a way that is responsible and worthy of, of you know, being, being a citizen uh, of, of the global community, then that does send a message about what the rest of us need to do to protect ourselves. We also, of course, in the, the early weeks of the pandemic saw officials of the, the government of China making threats, uh, saying things like we're going to force the United States to swim in a sea of COVID. Um, I think that, that what the virus has done is, is really um, opened people's eyes. Uh, and certainly we do need as the United States to be part of ensuring that we can help to uh, defeat the virus uh, because of the technological advances that you both have mentioned, because of the uh, efficacy of the vaccines that we've developed, making sure that we're doing everything we can to, to help to, to um, get those vaccines to the people who need them. We need to fight against uh, vaccine hesitancy, which we've seen certainly in the United States and, and I would imagine around the world, although I'm not as familiar with the, the reception of the vaccine globally. But, um, but I think as we do that, we also need to think about um, how dependent we are, how dependent our supply chains are, uh, have, particularly the pharmaceutical supply chains. Um, you know, we, uh, Mark mentioned the debt, uh, which makes us very dependent, which is uh, also a real threat. But I think all of these things have demonstrated for us over the course of the last year, even people who perhaps didn't recognize before the, the fundamental threat posed by uh, the, the government of China, um, not just by their intentions, um, and their, their determination uh, globally in terms of their military capacity and power, but also their economic power and, and their willingness to, to blackmail uh, the rest of the world. I think we, we do need to work together with our allies to move supply chains, work together to help incentivize companies that are willing to do that and to help recognize we, we can't continue to uh, facilitate the kind of dependence, particularly when it comes to matters of, of life and death um, that, that we've seen certainly over the course of the last uh, several years. Thank you, Liz. And uh, with the uh, about five minutes left, uh, uh, Congressman, I think I'm going to throw the last question to you that builds off of what, uh, what Liz was just saying. You know, in recent years, the Chinese haven't been uh, satisfied just to advance their soft power through the, the various means that we described today, but they've also uh, had a very uh, strong offensive uh, with disinformation and against media freedom, controlling the uh, controlling the uh, behavior of their own people and even of corporations and others outside of China, uh, where China can extend its influence into their societies. Um, Chris Walker at the National Endowment for Democracy has called this sharp power. It's a it's an additional tool that the Chinese have used in order to advance the Chinese narrative and support the Chinese system in a, in the global order. I'm curious, though, uh, I've recently seen the Pew Charitable Trust uh, polling on the global reputation of China, and China is actually doing quite poorly for all that it's investing in both uh, defending its own reputation and attacking the reputation of other countries. China doesn't seem to be succeeding in the space of soft power. Uh, Congressman, if you could just uh, wrap up with your thoughts on uh, what are the disadvantages that the Chinese have? Uh, in the in the soft power competition, why are they apparently losing the world despite the massive resources that they're pouring into this endeavor? Well, I think that's you know ultimately, d despite the Pew's polling, uh, there, I think there's a disconnect many times between 
the, the popular uh, perception, but then you know, what governments need and want. Um, and when they, uh, you know, they aren't constrained by the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act in terms of moving into areas uh, of, of uh, the, their ability to influence sometimes unsavory uh, local officials, uh, their uh, ability to move in with serious uh, infrastructure projects and often uh, buy their way to the buy their way to their top or buy their way uh, inside uh, in many ways is is proving effective. But to your point, uh, we are seeing a backlash uh, in terms of what they're doing environmentally, uh, what they're doing uh, uh, when when some of these unsavory officials turn those technical tools on their own people. Uh, but it is very hard for us to compete with free uh, when they're giving away uh, surveillance equipment through ZTE, when they're giving away telecommunications equipment, or at least doing it at rock bottom prices uh, through uh, Huawei. That is, that's incredibly difficult to compete with. Case in point in the Panama Canal, um, a, a Chinese private equity firm bought into uh, one of the distressed ports, uh, bought a controlling interest, uh, then state supported and state subsidized their fees, uh, dropped them nearly to zero, put the other ports, competitive ports, almost out of business, and then bought up those assets as well. So that type of kind of predatory practice uh, is very difficult for us to compete with, but does ultimately often create um, a, a backlash when people wake up to um, uh, to what's going on. So we'll have to continue uh, to, uh, through our diplomatic engagement, uh, through our military and military engagement, to continue to make those points that, you know, everything that the Chinese and the CCP are offering comes with strings attached. Uh, the, you know, the juice isn't often worth the squeeze in the long run for these, for these countries. But gosh, in the front end, it is, it is very, very difficult uh, oftentimes for us to, to compete with. And I have these same conversations uh, with, uh, with our companies. I just had a very difficult conversation with a senior executive at a, uh, at a company that wanted to sell uh, engines uh, into the Chinese market. And I said, look, we've seen, I understand you're, you're, you're worried about your next couple of quarterly reports, but we've seen this movie of reverse engineering, standing up their own entity, pricing them out of the market through state subsidies uh, and then gobbling up market share. Ultimately, it's not good uh, for both our companies uh, in the long run, and it's not good for uh, these, you know, buying into these types of practices aren't good for our allies around the world, but it is going to take a ongoing concerted effort on all of our parts uh, to continue to make that case. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Congressman. Thank you, all of you. Uh, Liz Cheney, uh, Mike Waltz, Mark Mount Brown. Uh, it's been an excellent discussion. Appreciate you giving us a little bit of your time to talk about this issue. And hopefully we'll see all of you out in Sedona next year. Uh, be safe and uh, thank you again for your time today. Great, thank you. Thank you, pleasure. All to right, be thanks. Appreciate it, Mark. Thanks, Liz. Thank thanks. you, Steve. Bye-bye. All right, bye-bye.